suppression, uh, Debbie, you can talk to anybody. This idea of voter fraud. Uh, I, I wrote a few things down here. Um, there's a there's some propaganda out there that there's dead people voting, right? There's you know undocumented workers from Mexico and they're voting, and these myths are widespread. Uh, and a lot of Democrats believe it, but in that, all the research I've done, it's extremely rare. Voter fraud is extremely extremely rare. When it does happen, it's usually uh, something in the office, a poll worker issue. Uh, could you or anybody talk about this? And, and keep in mind that if you go online, there's footage of certain Republican candidates, especially a couple in Pennsylvania, that have said specifically that this myth of voter fraud is a way to enact strict voter ID requirements, mm -hmm. which they know reduces Democrat votes. It's on camera. These are one of those things you're not supposed to say on camera, but well, they slip up from time to time. That's right. It's out there. So. Doug, can you talk a little bit, or anybody, about this idea that there's massive voter fraud, you need to restrict, you know, have super strict uh, requirements? Before I get to that, I want to add one thing to the last conversation. It takes at least a generation to change a culture. We know that. We used it with smoking, we used it with alcohol, we used it with drugs. Everybody knows that. It's one thing to address the problem of these generations in the room. Yeah, people should vote, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, people should register, that's just my opinion. But how do you change the way an entire generation thinks? Take those kids with you when you go to vote, okay? If you come in to early vote, we've done several things. We have a program we take out to the schools that's called Taxation and Representation. It's outstanding, it's good from, from preschool all the way up through high school. We've gotten rave reviews and it was a, a 2 a.m brainstorm. I woke up with the thing fully formed in my head. But the kids love it, the teachers love it. It takes about an hour. If you have a kid or a grandkid in school, have the teacher call and we'll come and put it on. That's not even an issue. For early voting, we've set up a machine just for the kids. We've got giveaways for the kids. We try to make it family weekends. Bring the whole family in after church and come vote. But if you don't get these kids interested, if you don't put it in their heads right now from this big, that they want to come in there and do that, that it's the fun thing to do, it's the right thing to do, it's not going to change. It's going to be another generation of the same. So don't think about just now when you're thinking about voter registration and getting out to vote. Think about future generations as well and start setting that pattern now. Our kids are our future. If we don't take care of them, we have no future. Don't realize that, right? No future. Okay? Now, what were we talking about? Voter, myth of voter fraud. <laughs> ah, myth of voter fraud. I can only speak for Lowndes, and I can somewhat speak for the state of Georgia. Um, any fraud that you see out there is probably not fraud. Now, I can't attest to other states at all, because I don't know what they do or how they do it. But generally, what gets called fraud are simple human errors. Uh, we had one situation in a polling place when we had the city-county school consolidation thing, where a poll manager took it upon herself to let county people vote on whether the city should give up their charter for the schools. Okay? I can't attest to whether that was on purpose or by accident. Um, those votes didn't count, so it wasn't even an issue. And the vote was a landslide, so it wasn't an issue. But that was not fraud, okay? That was a major error on the part of a poll manager who is no longer a poll manager and never will be. You know, As long as I can remember this, nobody will ever be doing that again. But that's generally the case. Um, when you have someone vote that wasn't supposed to vote, like an illegal alien or somebody that's dead, generally if that pops up, it's a father and son, same name issue, and a poll worker didn't check the date of birth. I promise you we train them to check dates of birth. We've been doing poll worker training this week, and I'm about horse trying to repeat myself, saying over and over and over, do this, do this, do this. But that's generally what it is, human error. Oh, ahead, Historically speaking, we have always used the concept of voter fraud as a cudgel to keep um, race voters from voting. This, since 1876, this has been a phenomenon. That's what they were talking about in it. Why Reconstruction ended the notion that somehow black voting was corrupting the political system, that there was this voter fraud, we need to kind of get rid of it. This is not new. It's, it's, it's in the media, it, it, but it... Um, this is kind of what they've always done. They've just generated momentum because of the Alabama court case that got the Voting Rights Act back to the conservative Supreme Court. That's the only reason why it's kind of come up lately. But this is kind of 
the norm for trying to convince people for stricter laws. It's been that way since 1876. Uh, the one other thing, historical thing I'd like to mention that we haven't really talked about yet uh, goes to your part about your point about gerrymandering. The one element of gerrymandering that we really haven't talked about is, and, and keeping people from wanting to vote, is the exact opposite way that we've been discussing it. Racial segregation um, as it exists and residential segregation and the way that realty prices and neighborhood segregation ends up working in our community ends up doing the same thing as gerrymandering because just as you are not likely to vote because you don't think you're going to win, the same thing is true if you know the guy in your neighborhood is going to win because you live in a neighborhood that has been artificially segregated to be one racial group or one political group. It goes the other way too. So these voting problems are not simply problems of voting. When we talk about um, prisons or residential segregation or the kinds of realty problems that we have that keep our neighborhoods and our schools segregated, that actually ends up becoming a de facto gerrymandering voting problem because it keeps people apathetic because the only people they are in contact with are people who vote like them and people who look like them. And that ends up doing the same kind of work that gerrymandering does just on the other side. And that too has been going on since the 1870s, since the end of slavery and the, 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 the tail end of Reconstruction. Okay. Um, I just said, whenever I hear about this idea of, um, of voter fraud, I always think it's just pretty I could do it, I would do it. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I also want to say for those of you who think that this, your children won't vote or your, your neighbor won't vote or your frustrations about that, I have two sons who are both in their two sons who are in their 20s, one who's crazy, and neither one of them vote. And the reason they don't vote is because they say they're in the South, they're Democrats, but they're not going to win any vote. And so it's not, it's not a racial thing, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's happened to this notion because of the Arab and because of way that um, we, we have split the country into places that are blue states and red states, and now we have, we have generations of intelligence, smart, black and whites, who just don't vote because they look out there and they say it's not going to happen. I'm going to say one thing, one other thing, and I'm going to quit. Listen, the one percent at the top in this country, if they wanted you to vote, you vote. It's yeah. just that simple. On the other hand, if the United States Congress decided tomorrow, they don't have to wait no, don't have to, no culture change in 10 years, if they wanted everybody to vote, all they said everybody would drive the license go vote. Why is it they do it in Australia when 97% of the people vote? Why is that? Because if you don't vote over there, you get fined. Not if you vote, but if you don't vote. And they can do the same thing in this country if they wanted everybody to vote. The truth of the matter is, they've never wanted everybody to vote. Never. And uh, I just hope that we just keep pushing and keep pushing, but you're not going to change that until you vote. You know, slaves, listen, 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 slaves could never vote to be free. Free people had to vote for slaves to be free. And we have to vote. Just that simple. I don't want to make no excuses no more. My message. Get, get out. <laughs> you know, next, next Monday is Columbus Day. What about having a national voting day as a national holiday? So that everybody has time. The working mother you were talking about, she's got time throughout the day. Because a lot of people, they do, as you know, they like to vote on election day. They don't want to early vote. They want to feel like they're part of the, the, the election day excitement. But then election day comes along and something happens and they can't make it to the polls. We could do an act something like that. National holiday for voting. Does anybody else have any comments? There's a real simple fix to gerrymandering, and it's called visibility. Okay? If somebody's watching them draw the lines, when you hear census, very shortly thereafter, they're going to start drawing lines. If there's a group of people watching them, that's going to change the dynamics dramatically. All you have to do is say, wait a minute, can't we have a little bit of you know, in the middle here and not one way or the other. So that's a number one thing. Get involved, pay attention, find out when it is and show up. That's everything from local, city of Valdosta, city of Hayhira, they have districts, all the way up to federal. Be there, be present, make noise. Visibility is uh, very important. Uh, and I agree with you 10,000 percent. I want to think back on Pastor Matt. Um, we miss our age group. I'm just going to say it like it is. 
you guys have missed our age. You know how I found out tonight? What about visibility? This was Pastor Rose said, hey, I got to speak at the uh, uh, Lyons County Democratic uh, Party. I said, really? I said, I'm going to come see you. That's how I got here. No signs other than right here. And guess what? I live in the neighborhood right behind me. Yeah, we do everything we can to um, Facebook. I even pay for extra Facebook boosts. So that it yeah, doesn't I like guess what I'm getting at is email. What I'm getting at is what I'm getting at is our age group. I'm 45, 46 here in a few months. Our age group. We're a very educated age group. I have two master's degrees, a bachelor's degree, get ready to work on a doctorate degree. Always worked in a very professional career. Had the ability and opportunity to vote, not do both. The problem is, very few people target our group and ask us to do anything. We, we are left out of the module, and uh, I think that if, if uh, there was more visibility and if there was more communication between you know, uh, us and the older group, more could get done because we are here to work. That's why I came out tonight. And in a lot of instances, in any environment that I go in, whether it be this, this environment, whether it be uh, even as a pastor, uh, even in, in any rank that we go in, our age group seems to be blocked out because we are highly educated. And for some reason, within that little, that little gap, we get pushed off into the curve. And so we go, into a, uh, we go into a cycle where we just work, take care of our families, we invest, uh, and we leave areas like this. This is the last place, and, and I'm going to be honest, a town like Valdosta, I got here because my job brought me here. But a town like this would be the last place I ever lived because it does not cater to my age group. Atlanta, D.C., New Orleans, San Diego, New York, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., New York, New Jersey, Chicago, those places feature us. That's how Barack Obama got in as a young, strong, African American who came in through Chicago. Places like that utilize us, put us to work, they train us, they, they bring us along. And places like this, until I showed up here with uh, moderating the debate and doing a few other things in town, nobody knew who I was. Can I say something about that? I, I just got to say this because I got to disagree with you on a couple things with it. I understand that. But I have been targeting black groups. I have personally, uh, personally walked to people, giving them forms to get on this board, go to the commission, get on these things and telling them, you are the people to get, y'all are the ones. I have. I even put out flyers. We have done this to the people. And I have, I mean, I even just gave them, gave them, them in their hand, told them when to be, how to fill out the form. The interest, their interest is not there. And it is that age group of, like you can say, I would say maybe in the 30s, I have really targeted y'all. It, it's hard to get people. A lot of them move out of school and finish school. Some of them I went to school with, some of them I know are finished. I don't know what, like I said, education. I don't know how to get them involved. But I know it's just a lack of their interest. I'm well, I think to I help have. you out, what you just said, you made a great point. You said, I don't know how to get them involved, but we know how to get them involved. I look, I look at Tony Todd. Uh, I'm really impressed with him. He's on Val Austin State's campus right now because they relate to his age group. And he's rallying these young students. These students have actually come together and they have an agenda. Now whether they're going to make it work or not, I don't think they have a good understanding of how the political system works. But the fact that they have enough sense of mind, presence of mind to come together and say we will elect one leader to lead us and we want to effect a change means that we should figure out a way to bring them under our veil and teach them the process so that we could be better, instead of letting them wander as a, an aimless group that really doesn't have a good direction. But the fact they came together is just, it's, it impresses me. May I say something? And nothing against you, but during, I'm a retired educator. Your age group, during that time, you guys were more career oriented and school oriented. You were not involved in politics. What do you think about politics? Only a few of you. So that's why. Your age, and your age group was targeted because I know I targeted a lot of students that came to me. But you're not interested at that time. You're interested with the education well, and career. Now. That's what I was about to say. Now it's time to move forward and get involved and help out.
Dennis? Yeah, before we, before we break up earlier, I introduced the candidates and elected officials. Commissioner uh, Joyce Evans is mm -hmm. doing the group as an elected official we wanted to have her. Is there, are there any other comments that Commissioner Marshall? I, I would just like to say I've, I've heard a lot tonight and, and a lot of perspectives. I always try to look outside of the box and I'm happy to hear everybody thinking and um, you know, come up with solutions and sometimes excuses for those who don't vote. Um, I'm reminded of a struggle that some of you all talked about for us in the bloodshed, uh, in particular, a guy by the name of John Weston Dobbs back in 1932. He became the Grand Master of Prince Hall uh, uh, Grand Lodge of Georgia. Um, shortly after that time, he made it mandatory that every Prince Hall Mason become a registered voter in order to become a member. It still stands to this day, okay? It is the one thing that has somewhat divided a lot of what we consider uh, other groups to form, formulate because they don't have the voting requirement, needless to say. But in, in saying that, you can always have some people that don't vote it for whatever reason, even though they know it's the right thing to do. I just hope that at some point in time we look at the individuals we're voting for. Because to me, it's about leadership. I hope that's a perspective that we understand. I think you want to touch it on a little bit of it at the end of the, at the, end of the day. That's what I just hope that, you know, at the end of my term, you don't vote for me just because I got a D or R by my name, but it's because the representing you all and actually in the trenches and doing what your desires and needs are. That's what it's about. If you have the right leadership, they will inspire any individual to get out and vote. I am a prime example of it. I got in a race a week prior to qualifying. I wind up winning. And I thank God for it, and I give him all the credit. I just encourage you all to be great leaders and get into the communities because that's the people are looking for somebody to follow. Okay? Yes. You know, if I can add, jump on how Willie Marcus is saying, I mean, everybody in this room who showed up tonight, we're the leaders of our communities. We are leaders. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to talk to some of our friends, talk to our coworkers. Right? We're, we're not the passive people. We're the, we're the go-getters. So I plan on knocking a few, on a few of my neighbors' doors that I don't know yet. They're going to get to know me very soon. I'm going to knock on the door and ask them to get out and vote. If everybody does that, I think we can increase voter turnout in this upcoming election, start making some changes here in Valdosta. And so uh, on that note, any other final thoughts? Hope to see you next month. Uh, we're probably going to be in the same room uh, for next month's meeting. But if you don't like us, if you haven't liked us on Facebook, stay informed on our meetings. Or if you haven't, if you're not on our email list, let me know so we can keep you updated on what's going on. So thank you everybody for showing up. Thank you. A round of applause for our speakers. I came here. I came here. Somebody told me that Martin Luther King Jr. was going to speak tonight. Well, I'm going to speak tonight.